Ladies and gentlemen, this is Günther Ziegler from Berlin. Of course, I wanted to be in New York for this event, for the celebration of 500 years Dürer's Master Prince. If you get to see this video version of my lecture, then this means that either Lufthansa pilots went on strike, or Homeland Security didn't let me in, or the New York taxi drivers didn't find Brooklyn Poly. Um, I don't know in advance what went wrong, but this means that you have only this video version of my lecture. The lecture is called Three Giants, Five Stars, Some Mistakes. You will see the giants, uh, Leonardo, Dürer, of course, and Kepler. You will have a chance to count the stars. There will be at least five stars in the lectures. There will be a bunch of mistakes, um, hopefully not too many of my own. Um, and uh, let's go into things. Perhaps before we get started, I still should say that I am not a Dürer expert and I'm not trying to pretend that. Um, of course, I grew up with Dürer because I'm German and I grew up as a boy with five marks bills in my wallet where five marks had a portrait of a young lady from Venice on them, painted by Dürer. Um, I also grew up in Munich where we have some of Dürer's greatest paintings in the museum, the Alte Pinakothek. Um, but I'm not a Dürer expert. I'm a mathematician, I'm a geometer, I believe in images. And so this will be a lecture of mostly images where I want to show you that you can actually see a lot of mathematics in the images, that images are a wonderful way to explain and to show things. But of course that's also very appropriate um, as we are celebrating images, most importantly Dürer's three master prints and perhaps most importantly among those three, the one which shows the Melancholia, which has this polyhedron in there. And actually I'm a geometer and one of my areas of specialty is polyhedra, so people consider me an expert on polyhedra and so you will get my perspective and my look on Dürer's polyhedra and in particular, of course, the one that we see in this image. My plan, however, is a bit larger. Um, here's the plan. We will start with, not with Dürer, but with Leonardo a few years earlier. We will watch him doing the first mistake. We'll see the first stars. Then we'll look at Dürer's polyhedron, the one from the Melancholia. Then I have to tell you about the German Revolution of 1522-1525. That's because that one's not in the history books, so I'm afraid you haven't heard about it yet. We will go back to Dürer and his unfolding problem, which is a great unsolved geometry problem still. We will watch Kepler doing his polyhedra and his stars. And in the end, in case the three giants of Leonardo, Dürer and Kepler aren't enough, Gauss is another one, a great mathematician, and we will watch him um, in the connection of this story as it unfolds. But we start with Leonardo, and actually we start with this painting, which is not Leonardo. Um, it shows a Franciscan monk called Luca Pacioli, who you can see him from his dress, which is uh, the monk's dress. But actually he was a mathematician, um, born in 1445, died in 1514, exactly 500 years ago, or in 1517, which would be 497 years ago, um, roughly 500 years anyway. Luca Pacioli published his first mathematics book in 1494, it was called Summa and it contained a summary of all the mathematics known at that time, which included, of course, a lot of geometry and arithmetic and so on. It also contains the first complete explanation of double entry bookkeeping, which is also known as the Venetian method. And that's why economists even today know Luca Pacioli, because he's the one who explained double bookkeeping, um, double entry bookkeeping. We are interested in Luca Pacioli, of course, because he's a mathematician and you see him in this painting with also all the various details of the profession. There is this chalkboard which shows a drawing from Euclid, um, actually also on the wooden frame. It says Euclides, so 
Uh, Euclid is mentioned there. He has a book in front of himself, probably his own, Summa. There is also a ruler and a compass. Um, in the lower right of the painting you can see a dodecahedron sitting there. And then there's a young man in the background and there is a glass model of a polyhedron. Who is that young man? Um, it is commonly believed that this is Guido Baldo de Montefeltro, who actually paid a lot of money for Luca Pacioli. He was a young count. Um, he, the, uh, Luca's book was dedicated to him. But there's an other theory um, put forward by Nick McKinnon, which says that this young man in the painting should be Albrecht Dürer, who had ginger hair and who has some common features with this person. So this would be a student, uh, perhaps a painting student in the back of the picture. So this might even be Dürer, although that's not the commonly believed theory. So, but in the, indeed I didn't show you this painting because of Dürer, but I show you this painting because of the glass polyhedron, which is actually quite uh, remarkable. George Hart, a sculptor who you should know in New York because he did a lot of things, among them he consulted for the Museum of Mathematics in Manhattan. Um, he has looked at this and said it's beautiful, it's, it shows all these wonderful reflections. Um, so this is a glass polyhedron half filled with water. Uh, the light comes from the upper left. Um, there's all these reflections one can see in there. Actually other people have argued that this is actually a rather bad model and all the reflections are wrong. But um, actually what is this? If we look at the polyhedron, then there's various ways to describe it. It's what they call an Archimedean solid. Archimedean means that this is made from regular polygons. So this is squares and triangles. One way to construct it would be that you start with a regular cube, then you shave off the edges, and then you cut off the vertices. And at the points where you cut off the vertices, there would be triangles still staying there. But at the point where you cut off the edges and what remains from the faces would be squares. So in the end, this is a polyhedron with eight triangles and with 12 plus 6 makes 18 squares. And it's Archimedean because all the vertices of this polyhedron are the same. Um, namely, um, at each of these vertices there are three squares and one triangle. So that's this Archimedean solid in the side of the painting. Um, of course we could ask why would this polyhedron be there in the painting? And we have a partial answer for that which lies in the person of Luca Pacioli, who then in his second book started to describe the regular and the Archimedean solids and he had all these wonderful paintings in there. So here is the glass model again. Today, of course, we could also build this glass model from glass. Luca Pacioli allegedly had models, but we don't have them anymore. Um, and this is a computer graphics rendition of the same polyhedron. Now the reflections should be approximately right. The geometry of the model are right. If you compare the two things, then you see it's pretty close. It's pretty good, but it's not quite perfect. Even more remarkable drawings of polyhedra then come in Luca Pacioli's second book. And the first one of these models I show you here. Um, so it's in the back of this book by um, Luca Pacioli where he finished the manuscript in 1498. And in the manuscript he said that his, we would say his flatmate, his apartment mate, drew the polyhedra for his geometry book. The book was called De Divina Proportione on the divine proportion, what we would today call the golden section. And this book about, a large part of it goes about the polyhedra and the back of the book has these drawings done by his flatmate and this flatmate was Leonardo da Vinci. The great Renaissance genius, perhaps the greatest genius that the Renaissance has produced. 
And so it's particularly interesting to look at these polyhedra that Leonardo drew. Um, this is um, a reproduction of one of these drawings which were hand-drawn, watercolor, very beautifully executed. You see again it's hanging on a string. And this one again is the rhombicubidodecahedron with these eight triangles and um, 18 square faces sitting in there. Here you can compare the glass model and the drawing. What Luca Pacioli also had in his um, book was the models which have pyramids erected on each of the faces. So where there would be a triangle face, there is a triangle pyramid, and where there's a square face, there's a square pyramid on it. Um, we can note that some of this really are inventions of the time. So this view of the polyhedra where you can really look into it because the faces just have frames, so the frames of polyhedra are perhaps something that Leonardo invented so one could see how they work from the inside. These starred versions with um, pyramids on all the faces are perhaps something that Luca Pacioli came up with. We don't know exactly, but we know that the geometry book with Leonardo's drawings um, is from the joint work of these two men. Perhaps I could explain a bit. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a bit younger than Luca Pacioli. He was also his mathematics teacher. And we should also say Leonardo was a genius, of course, but actually his knowledge of mathematics was rather poor. Even in his notebooks, he makes mistakes again and again with simple arithmetic. And even though Leonardo wrote that no one who knows, doesn't know geometry should read his books, actually he never completed a book and also he didn't really know that much geometry although clearly he was interested and he worked hard on it and these polyhedral drawings are one proof for that. So it's particularly interesting if now we catch him on making a mistake. So here's again this polyhedron um, shown in a colored way that you can see some particular spots. You see in the middle, um, in red, a pyramid over a triangle, so that's a tetrahedron sitting there. And to the left and to the right of that, you again see these pyramids on it. And at the bottom, where there should also actually be a triangle pyramid, we realize that Leonardo got it wrong. Intentionally or not, we don't know that, probably not. But Leonardo did a mistake, and so in this beautiful drawn model of a polyhedron, the stellated rhombo dudecahedron, we catch Leonardo on making a mistake in the geometry. That's not a scandal, although it was, was reported as such, but I think it's an interesting observation and it also tells us that we really have to look at the details of these drawings and not only at the big thing which is clearly very beautifully done and very beautifully executed. Leonardo does a mistake. Isn't that wonderful? On the other hand, we should note that on the one hand, this invention of the stellated rhombe judecahedron is something that still um, is around us today. Actually, in Germany, there's a little place called Herrenhut where they make Christmas stars that they export into the world. Um, before I show you that, I show you this little wooden model which is now computer graphics generated and if you now compare the two things then at the bottom you see that the correct drawing would have this triangle where the incorrect one has the square pyramid at the bottom. But this is now the Christmas star, the way you can buy it actually all over the world, the Herrnhuter uh, Weihnachtsstern which has exactly these triangle tips where the vertices of the cube were and so on. So it has the same combinatorics as the Leonardo Pacioli polyhedron, uh, except at the top where there's one tip missing. That's where the electric cord comes for the light bulb inside the star. I noted that Leonardo made a mistake in this drawing, but actually if we see the knowledge of geometry today, here in the logo of the company, 
that sells the Christmas stars, then you realize that there's a lot of artistic freedom that the people from Herrenhut are allowed to take in representing their Christmas stars. So actually, if you take this as sort of the benchmark of modern technology, then you see actually Leonardo was pretty good. End of the Leonardo story. And we come to Dura. And of course, we have to look at the polyhedron in um, Dürer's etching from 1514, which is a remarkable polyhedron um, in various ways, uh, one of them being that it's the earliest image I know of a polyhedron which is not one of these uniform polyhedra of these Archimedean solids. Um, Dürer's polyhedron, the way we understand it today, has six pentagons. In the front we see two of them very largely. And it has two triangles. And so there's two different types of vertices. Um, there's the triangle on top and the one on the bottom. So this has six vertices which are in the triangles. And there's six more vertices which are not. Um, so this is not a uniform polyhedron. So the question of course would be why did Dürer choose this polyhedron? How did he construct it? Why did he put it into the Melancholia? And the truth is, actually, we don't know. What we do know is that it's not quite a coincidence. This polyhedron appears um, in various places in Dürer sketchbooks, and I will show you in a second. But there's also all kinds of theories around um, of what this polyhedron means and uh, where it comes from and how it is to be interpreted. As it was announced that I would lecture in New York at this, um, at this festival today, um, I got a number of phone calls from people who actually have been studying Dürer and this etching and have been developing theories and I've studied some papers and there's amazing theories around why this polyhedron should be the one um, that appears in the picture. Um, one is that this is actually a crystal um, calcite, which does also appear in nature in this shape, so Dürer might have been inspired by that. Um, there is another theory which says that this should be a polyhedron which has all the vertices on a sphere, which would explain the shape to a certain extent, so the polyhedron really is a cube, but then stretched in vertical direction, and then the top and the bottom vertex is cut off again in such a way that it again fits on a sphere. That's one of the theories. Um, here's another theory by a doctor from Munich, Ernst Theodor Meyer, who said he would make it to New York for the um, symposium, so he might be in the room today, um, even if I didn't make it, and who explains that this polyhedron has two projections which have a double meaning. If you project it to the to the surface it stands on, then you suddenly see a star of David, a hexagon. Whereas if you project it to the side, you find vertices which you can find again in the magic square in the um, Dürer etching. So this is two meanings that are in there that show you that this is not a random polyhedron. Actually there's all kinds of Freemason symbolry that you can apparently attach from that and you find Maya's paper on uh, a website um, of Freemasons, interestingly enough, where he says he's not one of them, but apparently they were very interested in this type of symbolism. Let's not overinterpret it, but let's look at just two sketches by Dürer. This here is from um, Stadtbibliothek Nürnberg, who has sketchbooks by Dürer published in 1969, drawings of polyhedra in Dürer's sketchbook and in the upper left of this drawing you see a construction of a pentagon which might be the one that he later used for the Melancholia. And this is a drawing from um, the library in Dresden, the Staats- und Landes Universitätsbibliothek in Dresden. And in this very beautifully um, done sketch, you see the polyhedron um, from the Melancholia and if we enlarge it a bit, then we see its geometry very clearly. So for example, we also get an answer to the question whether there is a triangle face that this thing stands on or whether the 
um, thing just has a tip which goes into the ground. Both would be possible, but this sketch suggests that this is a polyhedron really sitting on a platform. Um, one other observation might be interesting, namely if we compare this sketch with the um, final drawing, then we see that this is really a mirror image. So going from the sketch to the copper etching, the Melancholia, Dürer changed the sides, or perhaps only that's an artifact that comes from the copper etching technique. I don't know. You see that there's all kinds of possible interpretations. Let me just mention one more because I thought it was so amazing. Again, George Hart, whom I already quoted, um, reported that this has even been uh, interpreted with a speculation that the cube represents masculinity and truncating it at the top in an upright position may have some Freudian symbolism. End of quote, end of my part of the interpretation. This was 1514. 1525, then Dürer presented another way of explaining polyhedra, namely you unfold them. And this would be a building plan that you can cut out of paper um, that gives you the Dürer polyhedron. But before we go there, I have to tell you about the great German revolution of 1522-1525, which is so wonderful because it's entirely peaceful it's a cultural revolution and it's one that's amazingly important not only for Germany but also for all the countries around. In 1522, two books were published, the third one in 1525. And the first book was a Rechenbüchlein, a little book of computation by a German um, mathematics teacher called Adam Ries. He's very well known in Germany. We talk about calculating according to Adam Ries. Um, Adam Ries published in 1522 his little calculation book and that was the explanation from which the Germans learned in German how to compute. So Adam Ries explained the numbers, he explained multiplication and addition and division and subtraction, so all the basic uh, ways of calculating. He also explained about uh, computing interest, the rule of three, basically all the basic things you have to know in order to do the math on the market, for example, was explained by Adam Ries in this little book in 1522, which was amazingly successful. It had something like 200 printings in the last next 200 years. And it may be the basis of the um, economic success of Germany in the 16th and 17th century, that suddenly the merchants and the market could do their computations and their trade themselves and they didn't have to wait for the Rechenmeister, the master of calculation, to do their calculations in order to find out in the market what things should cost. This was a revolution. Uh, the important thing about Adam Ries' book was it was published in German so everybody could read it and one didn't have to have studied somewhere in the university or gone abroad in order to learn how to do this type of calculations. This was the first book of the Great German Revolution by Adam Ries. We know very little about Adam Ries. Um, this is the only portrait we have in a later book of his where it says that this shows Adam Ries in the age of 58. Um, and so um, we know from this picture how old he was, so we know um, roughly um, when he was born and when he died. Um, so this is a book from 1550. Adam Ries was the first book of the German Revolution. Um, the second one in 1522 was by Martin Luther, the first part of his translation of the Bible into German. I won't say much about Luther because that's not our topic for today, but it's clear that this has also influenced German and European history. Um, I just put here one quote um, which is put into the mouth of Luther. Actually, he never said it, but still you find it on the internet as a quote by Luther, which uh, says that uh, medicine makes people sick, mathematics makes them sad, and theology makes them sinful. Again, this is not our topic, so the interpretation is left to you. 
but this is Martin Luther, the second book of the Revolution. The third book of the Revolution, and that's why I tell you this whole story, was a book by Albrecht Dürer, namely his geometry book from 1525 called Unterweisung der Messung. So it's the um, instruction of measurement and drawing with compass and ruler and all that put forward by Albrecht Dürer in the year of 1525, Dürer's geometry book, um, which Dürer said that if you read your Euclid, then the first part of the book you won't even need. He says that he learned Euclid. Actually, he also learned from Luca Pacioli, but he doesn't say that much about that. And he explains the basis of geometry um, according to Euclid. And then he goes forward and shows how you can use that to do geometric construction. And of course, he did this for the architects and he did this for the painters because he believed that every artist would have to know how to draw and would have to know how to construct perspective and all that. That's Albrecht Dürer, um, a Renaissance painter and artist and the most mathematical of all of them, certainly. Um, and the most mathematical one in Germany. So he's the one to whom we owe this third book of the revolution. Let's look into one of the pages of this book, rather in the beginning where he does explain the conics and he explains constructions for the conics, namely um, the parabola, the hyperbola and the ellipse, which you can construct by taking a cone, a circular cone and you cut it by a plane and depending on the slope of the plane, you will get an ellipse or a parabola or um, a hyperbola. All this was known in ancient, ancient Greece. Um, Dürer explains it. He finds German names for these things. So the ellipse he calls an egg line. And then he gives this rather interesting construction method for the ellipse and Interestingly enough, this is not a very convincing ellipse if you look at it. Um, as we all know, an ellipse has two axes of symmetry, so it shouldn't have a more acute end than the other one. So this is more an egg than an ellipse. So Dürer didn't get it quite right, which is okay. It's still beautifully executed. Uh, it's in particular okay because Dürer very well knew the difference between an approximate construction, and that's what he's giving here with this method, and an exact construction. So for example, in the same book he explains an approximate construction of trisection of the angle, where now we know that there isn't even an exact construction with ruler and compass. Um, but Dürer makes the distinction, and this is his construction of the ellipse in an approximate way. And we see its faults, but we also see that it's beautiful. And certainly Dürer was a giant and um, a genius. Let's look at other ellipses. If you think this wasn't relevant for the Melancholia, then of course if you look at this part of it, then you see that there's actually several ellipses around. There's for example the one in the bell, which if you look more closely you see that even that one has two ends which are not really the same curvature. So it's a bit more an egg than an ellipse. Um, but there's also the scales, which again what you see there is an ellipse in the etching, beautifully executed. You can measure the details whether Dürer get did get it approximately or exactly right. There's even more ellipses in the picture if you look at the lower left of the picture just next to the sphere. There um, is some kind of a lamp or so which again shows these, conical, uh, these elliptical shapes. The reason why the painter has to know about ellipses is because if you have any circle and see it in perspective, what you will see is an ellipse. So all these ellipses are very relevant for looking at and interpreting the melancholia. Before we criticize Dürer too much for not getting his ellipses exactly right, we could also look at some modern drawings. And again here I brought an example for you, 
from the Handbook of Applicable Algebra at 1985. So this is not 500 years ago, um, but just 30 years roughly. And this drawing is supposed to illustrate that if you cut a circular cone by a plane, you get an ellipse. And in order to really realize how wrong this is, I have to show you a corrected version, which would be a bit better perhaps. So these guys who did these drawings, probably for Wiley the publisher, got it completely wrong. And I would say in 1985, that's a shame if people don't know their geometry. At least Dürer would probably have agreed with that. Let's look at more of Dürer. Dürer in this beautiful geometry book from 1525, illustrated with his own drawing, goes back to the polyhedra. And he mostly has drawings of most of the regular and the Archimedean solids. Um, here is one of them from the, um, from the collection. It's the icosahedron. May I remind you that Euclid's elements ended with the construction of the platonic solid, so of the dodecahedron and of the icosahedron. So this is the high point and the final achievement of Greek, ancient Greek geometry. Here is Dürer's representation, which on the one hand again isn't quite correct. If you look at the drawing there of the um, icosahedron inscribed into the sphere, then you see that there's these vertices F and D, which actually if the drawing would be really correct wouldn't be quite on the surface of the circle, but they would have to be a little bit to the inside. So it didn't get it quite right. Very nice exercise to work out how it would be correct and what Dürer didn't get quite right here. On the other hand, Dürer invents something new in this book, namely these nets. He unfolds the polyhedra, you cut them open along some edges and then unfold everything into the plane. And of course, that's also a good way to, for example, make paper models. You would just take your book by Dürer. If you have an original, please do not cut it with uh, scissors, um, but rather make a Xerox and then cut it and then fold it and glue it together. And that's one way to construct the icosahedron. Here's two more examples from Dürer. But before we go for Dürer again, let's not forget if Dürer didn't get things quite right, how about modern times? This is the logo of the Mathematical Association of America in a version from the late 1970s. So this is less than 40 years ago. And this is um, the version a few years later after Branko Grünbaum noticed that the drawing on the left is badly wrong. And in order to see that it's badly wrong, let me just give you some little red lines. And these three red lines should really be parallel if you have a correct representation of the regular icosahedron. And you see that that's happening that way in the corrected version, but not in the original version. Here's another net from uh, Dürer's collection, which is again interesting because this one is not an Archimedean solid. But actually, it's a shape that you get if you take six regular 12 gons and glue them together in basically the shape of a cube. You can probably visualize the polyhedron we would be getting here, which has these six large 12 gons. And then there is triangles at the corners of the cube. And Dürer notes correctly that these triangles would be eight regular triangles, but there would also be um, 24 non-regular triangles. On the other hand, if you look more closely, you realize that this net is not correct either. There's vertices that he didn't even reach with cutting it open. So here's another little mistake hidden in there. Here's another one from Dürer's collection, and this is a puzzle for you to figure out what is this polyhedron? Um, you've seen it before in my lecture. It's one of the Archimedean solids in a very beautiful Duranet. 
So Dürer invented these nets and since then, since 1525, um, there's a problem around which still isn't solved, namely the question can you take any convex polyhedron and cut it open along some of the edges and fold it into the plane. In other words, can you make every convex polyhedron from a sheet of paper as a paper model or would you need two sheets or three for some of the polyhedra? This isn't solved um, and the reason isn't that people haven't tried. There's lots of studies from the last 20 years who try to make progress on this Dürer um, problem. Um, let me just quote um, four things. Um, the first observation due to Komei Fukuda is that there's even tetrahedra which have just four vertices which if you cut them and fold them open the wrong way they overlap. The second um, is a study by Wolfram Schlickenrieder, a, stu a student of mine who did a big experimental study with lots of polyhedra um, published in 1997 where what he found is that there wasn't a single polyhedron that he couldn't unfold without overlaps, but actually none of the methods we tried worked on all the polyhedra we had. So out of this there didn't even come a guess for a method that we could use to unfold every polyhedron. The th Let me just show you here one more of these um, polyhedra from the study of Wolfram Schlickenrieder where you see that he's done numerical things and this is a nice unfolding of a random polyhedron more or less where again you see there's some overlap so this is from a method that didn't work and this um, is a proof that one of the methods we discussed at the time doesn't work. Um, up to now, as far as I know, there's not even a guess for a method of how to cut open a polyhedron systematically to know that it unfolds into the plane without overlaps. There's two more studies I can quote at this point. Um, the, um, one is by Ezra Miller and Igor Puck rather recently who showed that you can unfold every polyhedron if you're allowed to cut through faces which isn't obvious either. And a very recent paper by Bohamed Gomi, uh, May 2013, who showed that if you first make your polyhedra suitably flat, then you can actually unfold them. That's not how Dürer wanted to do it, I assume, but it's also sort of a step towards understanding what happens in Dürer's polyhedra. That's the end of Dürer for my lecture, but I want to show you how Kepler, years later, really continued the story. Um, Johannes Kepler is a um, German mathematician and also astronomer, I guess more well known as an astronomer by now. But actually Kepler, um, born in 1571, so we've made another jump of roughly um, 50 years. Um, Kepler um, did on the one hand do the studies of planets and uh, planetary motion, all these. On the other hand he did study polyhedra and interestingly enough in Kepler's writings these things are very much connected and intertwined. Some of Kepler's theories didn't really quite make it in the end. So this is Kepler in a portrait this is a rather famous drawing from Kepler's um, book Mysterium Cosmographicum from 1596. Um, so we are roughly in 1600 now, 75 years after um, the Melancholia, where this is sort of a visual representation of a theory by Kepler about the planets which said that the regular platonic solids put one into the other would explain the radii of the, um, of the circles on which the planets should move. We know by now this doesn't work. It already doesn't work because of the simple reason that Kepler at the time knew only five planets and uh, soon after that more were discovered so uh, there weren't enough platonic solids anymore. But this was one of his theories and we see it's a close connection between the planets and the polyhedra. 
And even if this theory didn't make it, clearly Kepler kept on thinking about things and there is um, polyhedra in all of his writings. Um, of course, Kepler is more famous now for the um, insight that the planets should really move on ellipses. This is a commemorative stamp of 400 years, the Kepler laws, and this is um, a stamp from 2009 and it celebrates a book by Kepler from 1609, his Astronomia Nova, the new astronomy, which has two of the three Kepler laws in it. Again, you can look at whether you find the ellipsis convincing. Um, I leave this to you. Um, little hint, look at the planet in the uh, inner ellipse on this drawing and look at um, whether you find it convincing at this point. Now, Kepler kept going and this is his book from 1619, so um, still 10 years later, um, Harmonice Mundi which again try to explain um, the radii of uh, the planet's paths with putting tetrahedron and cube and other polyhedra one after the other. Um, not convincing according to current understandings of geometry and physics, but still it was there. Kepler's book from 1619, however, contains a lot of other important insights. Um, this is a plate of drawings from this book and in this book and what you can see there is the regular polyhedra. Again in the upper right you see the icosahedron. Some of these drawings perhaps geometrically not quite convincing but Kepler wasn't an artist. I don't know who did these etchings. In the lower left you see the Kepler star polyhedra. That's polyhedra that Kepler discovered himself. And the main mathematical insight perhaps was that Kepler completed the classification of the Archimedean solids. Um, Thirteen of them that you see here in this drawing from Kepler's book 1619. And the number 10 on the plate on the right indeed is the rhombi dodecahedron again, which we had seen at the beginning of this lecture. Um, now in this complete classification of Archimedean solids done by Kepler, one of his mathematical achievements, um, one of the lasting mathematical achievements of Johannes Kepler, the astronomer and mathematician. Um, another one, as I mentioned, are his star polyhedra. Now this is again modern computer graphics, which gets it better than what you see in these black and white color plates. I end my lecture by the fourth of the three giants, Gauss, because if we look at Gauss again, we realize that he connects uh, mathematics and astronomy in a remarkable way. We get back to the ellipsis. Um, perhaps I have to remind you of who Gauss is. Uh, if you're German in my generation, then you still remember these 10 D-Mark bills in your wallet. Um, that's one generation later than the bills that had Dürer on it. So this shows Gauss, the mathematician, on the bill. Again, you might notice that the sides are flipped because this here is the original portrait and apparently the person who did, I don't know, the copper engraving for the bill flipped him over. In that case, I would guess not a question of technology but a question of the fact that any portrait on a bill always has to look to the left for some kind of iconographic reasons that I don't know about. So this is Gauss, um, the first of the mathematicians, um, German number theorist but famous for many inventions between number theory and physics. And indeed the thing that made Gauss famous was the ellipsis again as an explanation for the stars. The story is that in January 1801 a planetoid was discovered, it was called Ceres, and they watched it for two weeks and then they lost it in the skies. The guy who had discovered it got sick 
and then they didn't find it again and Gauss solved the riddle, he did the computations, basically he fitted the ellipses to the very scarce data that were available and told people where to look in the sky in order to find Ceres again. And this is a sheet um, hand drawn by Gauss after the fact a few years later, sort of noting his discovery. If you look at the detail of this in the upper left, then here it says Ceres wiedergefunden von Zach, December 7, 1801. So this is the young Gauss, um, 24 years at the time, um, making this astronomical prediction based on fitting ellipses, um, which is the one that made him famous. It definitely wasn't his number theory book from the same year that was hard to understand and hard to read and wasn't understood for quite a while. It was this that made Gauss famous. Um, again, we can look at the drawing, we can see whether we really find the ellipses convincing. They don't have quite the eccentricity that we saw on the stamp, but clearly this is more realistic if we look at planets. Um, and so in that sense, Gauss completes the story that I started with you and with this lecture about three giants, Leonardo, Dürer, Kepler, and Gauss. Well, mathematicians can't count, that's one of the rules, so that's my three giants. You've seen a number of stars in this um, lecture, including the ones that aren't stars, but they are what we now call planetoids, little planets, in this drawing by Gauss. You saw a bunch of ellipses, you saw the melancholia, of course, and various aspects, not only the polyhedron, but the ellipses. And this brings me to the end of my lecture. I can just offer you a few more images. This is images from the cover of my recent book about images from mathem mathematics. And in case we haven't gotten to the count of five with the stars from my title, there's another star in the upper left-hand corner that we call the Enzensberger star. And this is thanks to not only German Science Foundation that supports me, but also the Collaborative Research Center Differential um, um, Discretization Geometry and Dynamics. That's what the DGD stands for. Um, that's a Munich Berlin Research Center about round things and not so round things. And I end with this, which I offer you as a present. It's the cut out paper model of the Dürer polyhedron with the beautiful Möbius logo of the German Science Foundation. That's the end of my lecture. Um, as I said, if you see this, then it says that I didn't make it to New York in time. So perhaps um, I can still make it to the end of the conference and be there. And perhaps this recording will be fun for someone who couldn't attend in New York if we can make this available on the internet. This is Günther Ziegler from Freie Universität Berlin, in this case in the TV studio of Freie Universität Berlin. Thank you for listening and enjoy the conference, enjoy the event, enjoy the party. Goodbye.